Hi, I'm Bruce Kobayashi, and uh, today we're going to talk about demand. Uh, the topics we're going to cover in this session include utility and demand, including demand and its relationship to willingness to pay. We'll derive individual demand curves. We'll look at a sur the surplus from a transaction. We'll look at product and market demand curves, consumer surplus, and we'll also uh, define demand elasticity. We'll then look at demand, revenue, and props, profit maximization from the firm side. So we'll look at marginal revenue and its relationship to demand. Uh, we'll look at profit maximization by a price setting firm. Uh, we will uh, define the learner index and uh, derive its relationship to elasticity. Uh, and we'll have two applications of critical uh, of demand uh, applied to critical loss and its break-even condition. And we'll also uh, do a short uh, session on UPP and diversion, upward pricing pressure. In the uh, uh, picture, we have a hill uh, depicting a utility function. In the uh, figure, uh, the horizontal axis measures utility. And uh, utility, uh, as you go up higher and higher on this hill, you're happier. You have a higher utility. There are two goods. Y is money uh, and X is beer. And as you spend your money on beer, uh, you have less money to buy uh, everything else that you would need to buy. Um, so um, Y is sort of the numerator uh, good where uh, it represents your power to purchase everything but beer. Um, here we have two choices uh, that uh, we're depicting. Uh, the choice on the left, the red dot, is four dollars and one beer. So uh, I, I pay six dollars and I get one beer. Uh, I also could uh, choose to pay nine dollars and uh, I get four beers. Those two uh, choices or packages of, of money and beer are um, are uh, on the same utility level. Uh, and we could draw a line through all the choices between money and beer in which I'm indifferent. And that is an indifference curve. Uh, we could also sort of imagine ourselves looking at the hill from the top. So the, the left-hand panel is a three-dimensional depiction of utility. The right-hand panel, we're, we're moving to two dimensions. So what we're doing is basically looking at the hill from the top you can imagine there's Sugarloaf in Rio de Janeiro, uh, and we're not like the left panel is looking at it from from the ground, and the right panel is looking at it uh, in from the air right above it. And that's what we're doing here uh, between the left and right panels, and we could see that uh, relative to that indifference curve we cut on the side of the hill, the left panel, and depicted it in two dimensions on the right panel, uh, we see that uh, the preferences or being higher up in the hill uh, relative to, to the indifference curve U1 are, are uh, all the points in the shaded area. Everywhere in the shaded area, I'm on a higher level and therefore I have a higher utility. And so the preference directions, I, uh, both X and Y are good. And so uh, I either prefer more beer and or um, um, uh, more money. You could also imagine uh, cutting uh, multiple paths uh, on the side of the hill. In fact, there are infinitely many, but I've, I've depicted four. Uh, and as you uh, go from U1 to U2, U3, and U4, you're, you're uh, depicting a higher and higher level of, of utility. Uh, and and uh, what you'd want to do is, is sort of go all the way to the top of the hill if you could. Why don't we actually then just say, well, let's find the top of the hill? Because like all economic problems, we are faced with scarcity. Here I have an um, uh, endowment. I, end, I start out the day with $20, and that's all I have. And I have to decide how much of that uh, do I want to spend on beer? If I spend uh, my endowment on beer, I um, have less money to spend on everything else. And how much beer I can get with my $20 or some subset of that $20 depends on the price of beer. Turns out that if you look at the, the budget constraint, 
uh, the slope of that budget constraint, assuming that the price of money is set uh, to one, it's a numerator good, the, the slope of that um, budget line is simply the price of beer. So uh, in this um, example, uh, the price of beer is $8, and I would choose um, to purchase one beer. What if I made another choice? Well, let's suppose instead of cho choosing one beer, I, I, I chose uh, a, a fraction of a beer or I chose a little more beer. Uh, if I chose either of the two red um, choice combinations, I end up on a lower utility uh, curve, U naught, than I would on U1. Uh, I am unable to achieve uh, with a price of beer of $8, an endowment of 20, uh, I, I am unable to achieve any utility higher than U1. And that is my constrained by budget and the price of beer, constrained uh, optimization, okay? We could then sort of think about plotting the, my uh, output, uh, optimal output choice, um, I, ultimate, I mean, my, um, optimal uh, consumption choice of beer, one unit at $8 on a price quantity graph. So uh, on the right-hand panel, I plot the price of beer, eight bucks, and how many beers I would uh, obtain. Um, and um, that is uh, the um, consumer's um, choice. And it is also, representing his willingness to pay. He's willing to uh, give up as much as $8 uh, to obtain that first unit of beer, right? And so the height of, of uh, the uh, dot on the right is the individual's willingness to pay. If the price was $9, he would not choose uh, to, to, uh, to acquire a unit of beer. Um, he would acquire less if he could get a half a, or a fractional fraction of, of a can of beer, but if they only sold it in uh, cans and they didn't uh, uh, let you take si sips or, or partial drinks out of a can at the store, uh, $8 is sort of your maximum amount, your willingness to pay uh, for that first uh, unit of beer. We can then imagine, well, what if there's a sale in beer? So, uh, um, instead of, of the $8 steep slope uh, price of beer, the beer falls uh, to PX2. Well, uh, when, what would happen to my budget constraint is it rotates out. Now with, with my $20, I uh, can afford, if I wanted to spend it all, a lot more beer. And if I wanted to, to buy beer, um, it's now cheaper, and it turns out that uh, given my preference and my endowment, I end up buying X2 greater than X1. So if the price falls, my optimal choice uh, is um, uh, to buy uh, a, an additional unit of beer when the price falls. And you can imagine the price falls again, I, I end up purchasing X3 instead of X2, and, and so on. And when the price falls even more, uh, I, I, I choose an even larger amount. And what we're doing in the right-hand panel is each time we think about the uh, thought experiment where the price of beer falls and so the slope of, of the budget line uh, rotates and gets flatter and rotates uh, outward from, from the endowment point, um, you, you end up tracing out a, a graph where uh, you have uh, price and quantity being inversely related. And what we have, are drawing here is an individual demand curve. Right? It is a, a plot of the maximum amount an individual is willing to, to pay for uh, a, a success of units of beer. Uh, if we sort of think about uh, a, a market price for beer um, and, um, and, and uh, put that on the graph, we'd end up buying X4 um, units of beer at the market price PM. And the blue shaded area is 
the individual's consumer surplus from that transaction of buying beer, um, um, buying X4 units of beer at, at PX4 or, or the market price. Uh, and this blue shaded area or consumer surplus is the value generated from those, the purchase of those, X, those units. Uh, we could also take an individual's demand. We could add a whole bunch of other individuals who also want to buy beer. And if we horizontally sum those individual demands, we can get a market demand. That is, that's the demand uh, for, for beer from multiple individuals. Uh, if we take the market price and we look at the uh, area above the market price but below the market demand curve, that's consumer surplus. And that is the value created from the purchase of XM units at the market price. And that is the value created by these transactions. Uh, that uh, accrue to consumers. Now, um, one concept which is, is critical to understand is demand elasticity. Demand elasticity basically tells us how responsive consumers are to changes in price. And it's defined as the percentage change in the quantity demanded over the percentage change in the price. This is a negative number, but it's also expressed as a positive number or absolute uh, value number. Um, demand is elastic, and that means it's very responsive. The, the amount that quantity changes is very responsive to a, a given change in price when the absolute value of the elasticity is greater than one or it's a high number. Demand is inelastic when uh, the elasticity is less than one, and demand is unit elastic when the elasticity is equal to one. So here we have a, a demand curve, uh, and we see that uh, the, uh, uh, it's, it's depicted as a linear demand curve. Uh, demand curves don't have to be linear. I've just drawn a linear demand curve for expositional uh, clarity and simplicity. Uh, if demand is elastic, uh, a 1% decrease in the price will result in a greater than 1% uh, increase in quantity. Um, so uh, think about a firm who wants to lower its price so it could sell more. Uh, what, what happens? Well, uh, if he's, he's charging uh, a, a high price and he lowers it a bit, let's say a 1% price decrease, he's going to get uh, a greater than 1% increase in quantity uh, because uh, at a high price, the quantity is low. And so uh, whatever increase in quantity is, it's gonna be relatively big. And you could see that uh, the red is sort of what he's gonna lose. He's gonna have to charge a lower price to existing customers and lose the red bar, but he's gonna gain a large margin or large amount of revenue, sorry, um, to the to the the one percent uh, of uh, the more than one percent increase in, in the number of people who who choose because of the price increase price decrease to now buy uh, the good, and so what what you're going to get is you're going to get uh, an increase in revenue from the um, price cut. Uh, the uh, marginal increase in revenue is going to be less than. The, the, the price, and why is that? Because uh, in order to, to get the uh, revenue from the, from the marginal customers you induce to buy from the price decrease, you have to cut the price, and that's a loss of revenue from existing customers, and that's the red bar. So it's a trade-off, and that's why the marginal revenue curve is below the demand curve. Let's look at uh, the point at which demand is, is um, unit elastic, right? Here, when the demand is unit elastic, a 1% price decrease is gonna result in a 1% increase in quantity. What happens to revenues, total revenues, when uh, you decrease price 1% and your quantity goes up 1%? The answer is nothing, right? And that is what you get, the marginal revenue from lowering price 1% and gaining a 1% increase in the quantity sold, uh, uh, increase in the quantity 
is the fact that your revenues stay the same. So your marginal revenue from uh, those 1% increase in sales is, is zero. Likewise, when, when uh, demand is inelastic, the marginal revenue is going to be negative, right? So now when you decrease price 1%, um, the, uh, the demand being when inelastic results in a less than 1% increase in quantity. You start from a very high base and uh, you can see that your benefits in, in increasing revenue, uh, the green bar are gonna be far less than the amount that you now have to uh, lose from existing customers because you have to charge them a lower price. This all assumes that uh, you are a um, firm that um, is uh, engaged in what we call linear or uniform pricing that you charge the same price to everybody. This is not gonna be true. For example, you can uh, engage in uh, what is known as price discrimination where you can charge different, charge and identify uh, different uh, customers based on their willingness to pay and charge them different prices. Um, this model is generally known as the uh, um, monopoly pricing model. Uh, in antitrust, we also use it in uh, um, uh, situations uh, or in industries which are structurally competitive, but uh, each firm sells a, um, a heterogeneous or differentiated product. And yet, so each firm faces a downward sloping demand curve. Um, and we could use this pricing model to, to model those firms' decision also. Um, in order to get uh, a, um, an analysis of what the optimal price for the firm uh, or the um, optimal price setting, uh, um, uh, the optimal price setting choice for a profit maximizing firm, uh, we have to add the marginal cost curve, which uh, we will talk about uh, in, in the next session. But um, what um, the firm wants to do is, is to maximize its profits. It basically sets marginal revenue equals the marginal cost. Why is that? Well, if it, it produces a unit beyond QM, the marginal revenue will be given by the marginal revenue curve. And the incremental revenue will be lower than the incremental cost. What happens to profits? they fall. Um, and so uh, the uh, monopolist will start at, stop at QM and will we'll charge a price PM. Uh, why doesn't uh, the monopolist want to uh, um, expand output beyond there? Well, the green area would be the gain, right? Uh, that would be uh, the margin. Uh, on uh, the additional sales that are induced by the lowering of the price below PM, but he would also lose uh, to existing customers from zero to QM, the red rectangle. And as depicted, the red rectangle is much larger than the green uh, square and therefore profits go down. Likewise, uh, a monopolist would not want to uh, raise its price above PM. What if it did? Well, uh, the gain would be the, the increased margin on the uh, customers that he retains, but the loss would be the existing monopoly margin on uh, those customers who no longer purchase uh, the, the good from him at the higher price. And so therefore the, the gain here is smaller than the loss. And so uh, the monopolist or uh, the price setting firm uh, would not want to uh, charge a uh, price higher or lower than PM and uh, produce and sell a quantity higher or lower than QM. Uh, the same kind of uh, um, the, the same kind of basic uh, analysis is at the heart of break-even analysis, which is used uh, in market definition. Uh, and critical loss analysis. Um, what you say is, uh, let's suppose uh, we uh, hypothesize, uh, given the current price, we also hypothesize 
a change in the price of 5%, right? So delta P over P is uh, 5%, and that would be a, a S, S SNP. Um, we, we, the break-even condition was, uh, would be what percentage change in quantity um, um, times the margin um, would, would cause the uh, firm to be indifferent between sort of the gains from the 5% price increase and the losses in sort of the existing margin on sales he would no longer make. So it's the same type of analysis of, of gains and losses when you raise price. Uh, critical loss takes the uh, break-even condition and turns it into uh, um, a percentage critical loss. And uh, what you do in, in uh, critical loss analysis, uh, you, you assume uh, under a, a, a SNP that um, um, you uh, have a 5%, so delta P over P is 5%. Uh, it's a, a small non-transitory increase in price. And uh, you basically say that if, if the uh, critical loss is uh, greater than uh, the, um, the, the price, 5% uh, price increase over uh, the existing margin plus the price increase, uh, if, if in fact the actual loss is greater than, than the uh, percentage uh, decrease in quantity defined by, by the critical loss, um, then uh, you would have to expand the market beyond the number of firms uh, uh, in, in, um, in order to define a, a defensible uh, market. All right, um, the last thing I wanna talk about in this session is uh, demand elasticity and the learner index. Uh, an important result in economics says that the uh, price cost markup, so the, the margin over the existing price uh, is equal to one over the elasticity of demand. And this formula is, is the basis for modern critical loss analysis and diversion analysis for, for implementing the SNP, SNP test. Um, here, here's, the, here's the math if, if you would, would uh, like to see it, but basically what the learner index uh, is only true at the point in which a price setting firm is optimizing. So setting marginal, price, marginal revenue over marginal cost. So the mathematics and, and the learner index where the price cost margin is equal to negative one over the elasticity uh, is based on that point and that point only in which marginal revenue equals marginal cost. You can see that um, a uh, price setting firm facing a downward sloping demand curve will always produce in the elastic range. Um, and uh, when they produce at a point where they're optimizing or setting marginal revenue equal to marginal cost, the learner index holds. How do we use that? Well, what we do is uh, if we assume, for example, in uh, a uh, differentiated products per trend model um, that um, the, the firm is starting at a point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost and uh, setting the optimal price uh, uh, P, uh, a 5% price increase uh, under current conditions will, um, will result in, in a, a, a loss. Uh, why? Because uh, the firm would not want to charge uh, above its optimal price P and so adding 5% on top of P uh, would result in uh, uh, losses because the, the, uh, the loss in the margin from those he no longer will sell to if he, if he increases the price 5% uh, will, um, will, will result in, in um, losses that are, are greater than any gains in the increased margin of those people he keeps. Uh, the basic notion of upper pricing pressure is that uh, with, uh, suppose you buy one of your rivals, part of what you used to lo lose, um, for example, some of the losses go to, to firms who are producing not identical, but similar products, which, which compete um, for your business. Uh, now that I, if I own one of the uh, 
competitor. So let's suppose half of the diversions went to the competitor uh, firm, which I'm now thinking of buying in a merger. Uh, the, the gains uh, did not, um, which formerly were less than, than the loss. Uh, now I, if, if the, the, uh, the, uh, what, the um, white box is now sort of those sales that I lost to uh, my merging partner, I end up getting those back. And it may be that uh, um, the, um, the uh, gains plus the recaptured diversion are greater than sort of the, the remaining losses uh, from, from sales uh, times the margin. And so that's the basic uh, intuition of upper price impression. All right, well, thank you uh, for your attention and I hope you enjoy uh, further videos from JAI. Thank you.